Good afternoon. We'll start this afternoon with uh, portfolio questions on finance, economy and fair work. Our first question from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the first uh, the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the single person. I nearly <laughs> called you the First Minister. <laughs> that was, and it's Kate's even better. <laughs> nearly there, but not quite. Maybe someday. Review the single person discount for council tax. Minister Kate Forbes. More than, <laughs> at the moment. More than delighted to answer that question. And the Scottish Government has no plans to review the single person discount for council tax. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, and I'm delighted that they are showing no plans at present because uh, a single person's discount is particularly important for pensioners on fixed incomes. Uh, uh, and it's good to know that the Minister is categorically uh, indicating that there'll be no change uh, because that's vitally important that we have that clarification and I look forward to seeing that continue. Thank you. Minister, briefly. And confirm that we have no plans to review a single person discount. <laughs> Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, can the Minister confirm that when uh, council tax benefit was devolved, the UK Tory Government devolved only 90% of the funding, leaving the Scottish Government and local authorities with a £42 million funding gap? And does she agree that this is typical of the bad faith shown by the Tories in the devolved powers? They then take every opportunity to cut Scotland's resources, regardless of the impact on the most vulnerable. Minister. Well, I can also confirm that it's typical of the Scottish Government's efforts to continually work to mitigate Tory austerity and to invest in public services. I can confirm that when council tax benefit was abolished by the UK Government in 2013, it transferred £328 million to the Scottish budget, corresponding to 90% of the projected costs of delivering council tax support in that year. However, working in partnership with local government, we responded quickly to put in place transitional arrangements to plug the resulting £40 million funding gap. Jackie Bailey. Current First Minister to rule out any changes to the single person's water discount and the single person's council tax discount at question time on the 8th of November, but she refused to do so. Given that these two benefits operate in the same way, the legitimate concern is that the Scottish Government's proposal to remove water discounts is the thin end of the wedge and council tax discounts for single people are next. Can the Minister tell me, will she rule out any cuts to single person's water discount as well as council tax discount. Minister. I repeat my answer that the Scottish Government has no plans to review a single person discount for council tax. However, in relation to water charges, which is something quite different, we have consulted, we have consulted on amending the present single person discount for water charges. That consultation closed on the 28th of September 2018 and a summary of the responses were published on the 19th of December 2018. And having listened to feedback from customers, we intend to undertake further research, further consultation and further engagement before making any decisions on whether to amend the existing discounts. Question two, Liam Kerr. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast for economic growth in Scotland over the next four years compares with that for the UK as a whole. Cabinet Secretary, Dermot Kearney. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts economic growth in Scotland to be faster than the Office for Budget Responsibility forecast for the UK in 2018. Comparing the forecast, economic growth per person it will be similar in Scotland and the UK over the next four years, but overall GDP growth will be lower in Scotland as a result of slower population growth. This certainly underlines the importance of Scotland being able to develop a migration policy tailored to our needs rather than those in the UK Government. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer in which he failed to make clear that the SFC's forecast showed that Scottish economic growth lags the UK as a whole for the next four years. Now, the SNP are always keen to blame their failings on the UK government or Brexit or sometimes even the weather. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us, in simple terms, if Scotland's growth rate is going to be relatively lower than the rest of the UK, how can that be due to anything other than the SNP? Cabinet that's Secretary. A, that's, a, that's very interesting, of course, because what Liam Kerr's forgot is for some of the quarters in the last year, Scotland's economic growth and GDP was outperforming the United Kingdom. So surely the same logic applies. That our uh, economic growth outperforming uh, the UK is uh, because of the SNP government. Well, you know, in truth, the reality is that a large part of macro 
economic policy is still in the hands of the Westminster government. We would like that to be changed. The biggest threat to the economy right now and the reason for the subdued figures in terms of forward look, forecast economic growth, the main reason is Brexit uncertainty. And who's caused that? It's the Conservative Party uh, with their gamble. So we're making a lot of efforts to enhance and accelerate our economic growth. Now, of course, it's only forecasts that we've referenced in terms of SFC and the OBR. Now, I just say as a matter of fact, the SFC forecasts are already wrong uh, for 2018. Scotland's outperformed uh, the economic forecast. And what's more, uh, the SFC had to revise up the economic forecast in terms of the Scottish context. So I appreciate, welcome the work of economists in forecasting economic growth. We'll do everything we can to stimulate that economic growth. But the reality is the biggest threat to it right now is Brexit mismanagement at the hands of the UK government. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. For the record, can the Cabinet Secretary again confirm what Scotland's GDP growth was predicted to be over the past year and set out what it has actually been? Cabinet Secretary. So, Mr Lyle's uh, question is, is further detailed to the point that I was making about the forecast from the SFC. We are already outperforming those forecasts. And, of course, there are revisions and a further estimate uh, for the final quarter. But in December 2017, the SFC forecast that GDP would grow by 0.7% in 2018. The full year growth figure for 2018 is not yet available, but in the first three quarters of the year, the economy has grown by 1.2%. So growth that is higher than the forecast, growth for 2018 is now, and I hear Richard Lyle is delighted by that news, <laughs> the growth for 2018 is now forecast, is now forecast to be 1.4%, double the original SFC forecast. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, presiding officer. We have much um, indigenous talent in Scotland um, that would do well to boost our economy, but financial assistance tends to be given to larger companies. Can I ask what the Scottish Government is going to do to encourage and grow our own talent and to support small and medium-sized enterprises that are more likely to stay? Cabinet Secretary. You know, I appreciate the question and the point. Actually, we want to upscale businesses, scale up businesses, get more businesses exporting, further diversity around that. So I welcome the question, and I don't in any way think that the member was trying to imply that we shouldn't also rely or, or try and encourage further migration to Scotland as a welcome addition to our economy. Because actually, its population it is a huge issue in terms of the economic growth that we would enjoy. Uh, but yes, I am directing the enterprise agencies to do even more around scaling up, supporting small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as the other efforts in the economic action plan. And I take the point um, on board. Even though unemployment is at a record low of 3.7%, there is still more we can do in terms of, I, I thought Labour members would welcome low unemployment, um, but surely there is more we can do around um, reskilling uh, um, uh, and also encouraging other people back into the workforce that have maybe have been uh, further removed from it than, than we would like. And so there are efforts around uh, gender and reskilling. Question number three, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the size of the Scottish Reserve is. The balance of the Scotland Reserve reported in the Fiscal Framework Outtown report in September 2018 was £192 million. Pounds. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary is proposing to draw down from the Scottish Reserve the maximum available sum in this current financial year. Given that the Scottish Fiscal Commission are forecasting a deficit of £472 million in income tax receipts in the current year, would it not be wise to top up the reserve at this stage rather than run it down? Cabinet Secretary. That's a very legitimate view that Jeremy, Jeremy Balfour puts across. If that's the formal view of the Conservatives, so be it. But not to do that would mean further reductions in public spending for Scotland's public services in financial year 2019-20. It's a legitimate view. If that's what I was to do, put more away in reserves for that rainy day, for reconciliation or any other matter. My judgment is that the economy needs stability right now, it needs economic stimulus, it needs certainty and it needs the sustainability of our public services. Therefore, the budget that I've uh, proposed, it does rely on some of that uh, transfer. There are other levers available to the government uh, in the event of a negative reconciliation. Of course, we would use the most recent uh, fiscal figures to do that. But it is a choice. 
But if I now follow the Conservatives on tax alone, that would mean half a billion reduction to Scotland's public services. And if I was to follow that advice, it would reduce further the spending for Scotland's public services in 2019-20 by not using reserves in the fashion that I proposed in the Scottish Budget. Bruce Crawford. I wonder the Cabinet Secretary would agree, but it's utterly hypocritical of the Tories to take this position, given that we saw in papers today from the Office of Budget Responsibility that every single penny that's going into the National Health Service, uh, mentioned by the, the, the Prime Minister, is coming from a borrowing, rather than a Brexit dividend. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the, the, the case of um, NHS funding in Scotland, of course, it's still uh, true to say that the UK government has um, shortchanged Scotland's NHS by giving us less resource than was previously committed by some 50-odd Eight million pounds and the UK government's mishandling of the UK economy and the Brexit negotiations has meant uh, that economic growth has been less and they're having to borrow more than they first thought. They actually do or did have more in reserves in terms of the firepower that they could have used to stimulate the economy and they chose to help hold that back. So whichever way you look at it, that the Tories' economic credibility is shot to pieces. It's just gone. It's just gone. The Tories have no economic credibility whatsoever anymore. And that's what's subduing uh, the economic forecast for the UK and, for that matter, Scotland. Question number four, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what general revenue funding it plans to provide to Aberdeen City Council in 2019-2020. Mr. Kate Forbes. Aberdeen City Council will receive almost £336 million of general revenue funding in 1920, and using their council tax powers could also generate an additional £3.7 million to support the delivery of essential local services, which means an extra £10.7 million or 3.2% revenue funding in 1920 compared to 1819. And in addition, Aberdeen City Council will also receive their fair share of a further £233 million following agreement on the distribution methodology with COSLA. Lewis MacDonald. The Minister will know that most of the sums to which she referred come not from general revenue funding, about which I asked, but from non-domestic rates. A government spokeswoman in today's Press and Journal confirmed that the Council this year is expected to collect over £255 million in business rates compared with a target of less than £228 million, a difference of nearly £18 million. So can the Minister confirm that Aberdeen City Council will be able to retain every single penny of that additional business rate income this year, as her representative also said and told the present journal? And if so, will she apply the same principle to the next financial year? Yes. I can confirm unequivocally that local councils keep every penny of uh, revenue raised through non-domestic rates. Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you. Uh, Northfield, in my constituency, uh, has 33% child poverty, while Bridge of Dawn, in my constituency, has less than 5% child poverty. When the city is looked at as a whole, the affluence of the latter masks the poverty of the former. Does the Minister agree that, as well as looking at revenue-raising powers for local authorities, it's also time that we took a look at how local authority finance is calculated and how need is calculated as well? Minister. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm afraid I missed that question. Was that... The member may repeat the question. Finally, presiding officer. Um, I mentioned two communities in my constituency, Northfield and Bridge of Dawn. One has 33% child poverty, one has less than 5% child poverty. But when the city is looked at as a whole, the affluence masks the poverty. So when looking at local government finance, as well as the debate that's taking place around revenue raising powers for local authorities, is it not also time that we took a long, hard look at how revenue for local authorities is calculated as part of the funding formula? Yes. Uh, I thank the member for that second um, asking of the question. And local authority funding is allocated using that needs-based formula. But the member raised a very um, good point around the importance um, of ensuring that the funding that is raised goes to the areas of um, greatest need. Um, of course, uh, any, uh, the formula itself is kept under constant review and is agreed each year with COSLA um, and to ensure that no local authority, including Aberdeen Council, receives less than 85% of the Scottish average in our per capita basis. The Scottish Government introduced that funding floor in 2012 to ensure that there was fairness. A further supplementary from Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I still remain an Aberdeen City Councillor? 
Uh, despite the, the, the Minister's warm words for local authorities, it would seem, according to Coswell, that the proposed settlement is insufficient and would send councils towards, I, and I quote, a cliff edge. Conversely, between 2010 and 11 and 2019-20, rates for businesses in Aberdeen have almost tripled, from the total of 84 million to 258 million. This represents an increase of 207%, compared with 52% increase in Glasgow, for example. So does the, camp, does the minister think it's, it's acceptable to simply shift the responsibility of his local government shortfall into hard-pressed local businesses? Mr. Well, um, as the minister responsible, I um, ensure that this year and for the foreseeable in next two years, there is a transitional cap on non-domestic rates to ensure that um, offices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire um, do not see a significant increase in their business rates uh, immediately, but that, that it, there is a transitional phasing. But the member knows fine well too, particularly as a, a councillor, that it's misleading to quote the general revenue grant funding alone, because the Scottish Government guarantees every local authority, including Aberdeen City, the combined general revenue grant and non-domestic rates income. And all of that money is spent on public services, which matter to the people of Aberdeen, although the council of course has freedom to decide on its priorities for the coming year. Question number five, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason its draft budget proposes a reduction in financial support for bus services. Mr Kate Forbes. Uh, financial support for the bus industry will not be reduced uh, next year. The draft budget maintains the same level of investment through the bus service operator grant of £54.2 million. And last year, the budget included a one-off allocation of £10 million of financial transaction loan facilities, which were not used as no viable option for their use, was identified by the bus industry. This year's draft budget includes an additional £3 million of capital grant funding for the bus industry. John Finney. Uh, I thank the Minister for that reply. It's certainly my understanding that funding has fallen from 64.2 million to 57.2 million. Uh, now, the, the ministers are very often keen to quote Professor Philip Alston in his UN report, which is very critical of the, the UK government. I'd like to repeat that, if I may, a section that says transport, especially in rural areas, should be considered an essential service equivalent to water and electricity, and the government should regulate the sector to the extent necessary to ensure that people living in rural areas are adequately served. The vast majority of public transport journeys are taken by bus, but pattern is just falling. How can you justify making a cut of seven million to support the services that so many of our communities depend on? I thank the member for that question and of course I do recognise the importance of bus services particularly perhaps in rural areas. As I said in my first um, answer we have worked together with the bus industry to try to identify a use for the loan funding last year but an attractive option did not emerge. Should a suitable option emerge in 1920 during discussions with the bus industry we will assess the possibility of accessing financial transaction loan but it's important to say that we continue to spend over £250 million a year supporting the bus network and funding concessionary travel and the current programme for government commits to providing stability for bus services which was one of their requests with funding over three years. Question number six, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure inclusive growth in Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government and its agencies continue to support significant levels of investment in Ayrshire in key areas such as housing, transport and skills to drive inclusive growth. An immediate priority is to press the UK Government to join us in agreeing uh, a growth deal for Ayrshire so that local communities can benefit from the same transformational investment being made in other city regions. Ruth McGuire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, the Ayrshire growth deal, which does indeed have inclusive growth at its heart, is crucial to the economy in Ayrshire. What more can parliamentarians and the Scottish Government do to ensure that the UK Government turn their warm words into action and sign the deal that will bring much needed investment and jobs to our Ayrshire communities? I suppose all of Parliament across the parties can uh, unite to continue to call upon uh, the UK Government to take this forward. I've certainly done it as, as Finance Secretary with Treasury uh, colleagues that, that I would meet. I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Connectivity and Infrastructure has written to the Secretary of State for Scotland in December urging the UK Government to match the ambition around the Ayrshire Partners uh, to have the heads of terms agreed by the 25th of January. Now, it appears at the moment that the UK Government will not be able to do this. We will continue to press them uh, in terms of getting the agreement for the heads of terms as soon as possible. I think all members across the Chamber uh, should continue to press the, the UK Government to, to do this as well. Ayrshire has waited too long for its growth deal and we want to get on with it. Emma Harper. 
Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday it was announced at Hurston's department store, which first opened its doors in Ayr in 1896, is to be the latest casualty in the decline of our high streets and is to officially close on the 7th of February, resulting in excess of 80 job losses. Given this news, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether the Scottish Government is aware of the issue and whether it has been in communication with the store management to see what, if any, support can be offered to both the store and its staff at this difficult time? Cabinet Secretary. Can I make uh, two points, uh, Presiding Officer? First of all, um, uh, Mr Hepburn will be involved as Business Minister and PACE are involved as well where there is the situation uh, of uh, redundancies. So that's the first point. There will be Scottish Government uh, uh, involvement through uh, SDS and, and PACE as I've touched upon. The second point I want to make is this. Uh, retail is under pressure right across the whole of the UK. That's part of the reason that in the draft budget we're proposing to give some relief uh, around uh, business rates in terms of what we've proposed uh, in the poundage uh, for uh, business rates because, because that and small business bonus and other reliefs are really important to help retail at this point in time and particularly town centres. 90% of all properties will pay less than they, uh, they would if they were um, south of the border. So that's an important point around uh, business taxation but also in investing in our town centres. We're proposing a £50 million town centre fund as well. So specifically in relation um, to uh, Emma Harper's uh, question, yes there's government awareness involvement through our agencies and more generally speaking I think all of Parliament should support a Scottish budget that's trying to give us competitive uh, non-domestic rates so that we can provide stability and stimulus for our economy and support where it's required as well. And Neil Bibby. A fair work action plan which aims for inclusive economic growth would be welcome and could help people in Ayrshire and throughout Scotland. Ministers had given a commitment to publish this document before the end of 2018. Can the Cabinet Secretary update us when the Scottish Government intends to publish this important document? Well, we are continuing to engage with trade unions. Uh, its publication will be imminent. I think it's important that we get it right. We've worked very closely with partners uh, and, and I say its publication will be imminent. And I look forward to, to the Labour Party welcoming it because I actually think we share a lot of the principles around fair work uh, that we want to extend uh, right across society in Scotland. Question 7 has not been lodged. Question 8, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met North East business leaders and what matters were discussed. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to engage with business partners across Scotland to ensure the best environment for business to thrive. Most recently in the North East of Scotland, the Minister for Public Finance and the Digital Economy met with SCDI members in Elgin on 22nd October. I met with Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce on 29th November and on 11th December, the Minister for Energy, Connectivity and Islands chaired the tri-annual meeting of the Oil and Gas Industry Leadership Group in Aberdeen. A wide range of topics were covered during these discussions, including skills, impact of technological changes, opportunities from the circular economy, population growth in Highlands and Islands, export, Brexit, innovation, investment, decommissioning, low carbon and fintech. Maureen Wood. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, the Minister will know of Aberdeen City Council's recently published Economic Policy, Policy Panel Report, which highlights the important role played by people who come to the North East from elsewhere uh, in, in, within and within the e, from within the EU, with a report highlighting that Brexit may impact on the flow of key skills to the North East economy. Does the Minister agree with me that Brexit poses a really serious risk to businesses in Aberdeen and that the UK Government must act to protect the flow of workers with key skills to the North East? Minister. <coughs> I absolutely agree. Brexit and the inevitable harm it will do for our economy reinforces the importance of all the steps we are taking to support businesses. We are intensifying our preparations for all EU exit possibilities, including launching the Prepare for Brexit multi-agency campaign on 1st November last year. This offers free advice and tools to support businesses to be ready for Brexit. In 2016, there were 128,000 non-UK EU nationals living and working in Scotland. These individuals and their families play a hugely important role in our economy and society and are critical to many key sectors, including hospitality and agriculture. Thank you. Question number nine, James Dornan. 
to ask the Scottish Government how its draft budget aims to help people most in need. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, the draft budget includes investing at least £351 million to uh, council tax reduction scheme, £64 million in discretionary housing payments, for example, to mitigate uh, the bedroom tax uh, in full, uh, £38 million in the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, in addition to some of those measures, the budget also proposes £826 million be made available to support our 50,000 affordable homes target, 35,000 of which are for social rent. A £70 million increase in the equivalent figure for 2018-19. It also uh, involves resources for our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. It outlines a number of key investments in the period uh, 2022, uh, which this budget will support, including intensive employment support for parents and a new financial health check service. James Dornan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In a time when the total Scottish fiscal budget has seen a real terms cut by the UK Government in this decade, what additional investment has this Government been able to generate through its tax and borrowing powers for Scotland's public services to support those suffering from these ongoing politically driven Tory cuts? Well, the UK imposed austerity, has indeed imposed a real terms reduction to the sc total Scottish fiscal resource budget. Um, of some have described this before. Uh, Murdo Fraser knows the statistics uh, well of £2 billion between 2011 and 2019 20. But our decisions on tax and borrowing reduced the real terms reduction to the total Scottish fiscal budget from 6% to 3.8% between 2010 11 and 2019 20, generating an additional £712 million for investment in public services. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that COSLA gave evidence to Parliament, uh, to the Local Government Committee uh, on the budget this morning, uh, which their representative said, councils have done all they can to make efficiencies. The core is simply crumbling. And when asked what services would be cut as a result, uh, leisure and uh, culture, sport, increases in fees and charges and employability support were all mentioned. Uh, Councillor McGregor said in many of these areas that they, they will directly impact uh, on people from more disadvantaged backgrounds. So isn't it clear that if the budget is passed in its current form, the people James Doran's question refers to, those most in need, will inevitably bear an intolerable burden of cuts to the services they most rely on? Cabinet Secretary. No, the opposite is true. It is the case that if the Scottish budget isn't passed, local government will have less resource exactly. in cash terms and in real terms. That's the alternative. It's that budget which allows a real terms increase in resource and capital to Scotland's local government, £11.1 billion at stake here. If the budget is not improved, it is less resource to Scotland's local authorities. That's what Parliament will be voting for if it doesn't vote for this budget. Less resource uh, to Scotland's local government who votes for the budget. It's a real terms increase. Again, set in the context of the UK, the UK settlement to Scotland. If we exclude the health consequentials, which is reasonable because we've said it will pass on the Barnet consequentials. Scotland will have, and they shortchanged the NHS, but Scotland, Scotland for all other portfolios would have had a reduction. But what we as a Scottish Government are proposing is a real terms increase for local government. So when I'm asked what's the consequences of the budget, it's a real terms increase for local government. And that's even before a uh, local government uh, uses its power around the council tax, which, if raised by 3%, would generate a further £80 million for local government. James Kelly. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary told the Local Government Committee this morning that councils were going to need to find efficiencies. The reality of that is that councils are going to have to make cuts if the budget is passed in its current form. So in South Lanarkshire, for example, they face making cuts of £17 million. The reality of that is cuts in jobs, cuts in services, and pain being inflicted on local communities. So if the Cabinet Secretary really wants to help those most in need, he needs to radically rethink his local government settlement so that we see a budget that supports local communities rather than providing cuts to local communities. I mean, I've just been asked by the Labour Party to rethink my budget. I would ask the Labour Party to think about a budget uh, because, you know, sources from within the Labour Party have said they're not even going to put forward a credible plan this year. What they have is a shambles. So how am I to take that? How am I meant to take that rhetoric 
in any way seriously from the Labour Party. At least other parties like the Greens will engage constructively. But from the Labour Party, I will have a shambles. I will have nothing. I will have no alternative. I have noise and rhetoric. Deafening me from the Labour Party right now with no serious suggestion. When what I described to the local government committee today, by the way, described uh, by the COSLA Resources spokesperson as having excellent priorities. The Scottish Government, for those that were witnesses at the local government committee today, said we had excellent priorities. That was the words from the COSLA Resources spokesperson, because we're investing in the kind of things that Parliament's asked us to do, whether that's the extension of free personal care, whether that's for mental health, whether that's for education, uh, whether that's for social care, important priorities. Uh, more in resource, more in capital, a real terms increase to local government. The alternative is to vote against that and local government will have less resource. That is the alternative to the budget that I've proposed to the Scottish people. Question number 10, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to improve productivity growth in Scotland after a report from the Scottish Fiscal Commission has highlighted that it is set to fall. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government published its Economic Action Plan on the 24th of October. The plan sets out a range of actions we're doing to support inclusive and sustainable economic growth, including increasing productivity. Uh, and the latest Conservative members might be interested in this. In the latest 12 months, Scottish productivity has increased by 1.3% compared to growth of 1.0% for the UK. So we recognise the impact of Brexit uh, with the Scottish uh, Fiscal Commission forecasting slow productivity due to a period of uncertainty. So that's why the Economic Action Plan lays out the several actions throughout it to address productivity. Examples include the development of the Scottish National Investment Bank and the establishment of the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, which will make us a global leader in advanced manufacturing supporting productivity improvements. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, regardless of the impact of the UK leaving the European Union, the Fiscal Commission is still concerned about Scotland's long-term growth, which is predicted to grow by only 1% per annum, when we might reasonably expect that the figure should be nearer 2%. This is a trend that they say is unlikely to end in the near future, even when isolated from other factors. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, are you concerned about the trend? And what actions do you feel that we need to take as a country and you need to take as a Scottish Government to ensure that that trend is turned around? Well, first of all, I've, I, I could go on at length about the detail of the Economic Action Plan. I'd encourage all members to look at it online. It has a range of actions to support productivity growth in our country. Of course, much of this is for the private sector as well. It's not just about the public sector. Productivity growth is also about business, enterprise, research and development, which is actually at record levels right now of foreign direct investment, which is second only uh, to London and the southeast of England. So we are doing more around investment, innovation, infrastructure, but productivity around people is significant. So in addition to those actions, it's actually the population challenge which is also an issue for us. And to address the population challenge that our economy faces, we need more migration powers. We need more uh, flexibility in that regard. And that's why we've set out uh, further changes and responsibility that we would pro propose to try and ensure that the population uh, challenges are dealt with uh, appropriately. For Scotland, that means population growth and not turning migrants away. For the UK government, it means a hostile uh, environment uh, for migrants. So I would encourage uh, Michelle Ballantyne and other Conservatives to contact their own government uh, to try and uh, support us in having the necessary flexibility that we require to improve productivity beyond that which we've set out in the Economic Action Plan. Question number 11, Brian Whittle. Uh, Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many of the 38,000 people that Fair Start Scotland aims to support it expects to participate in each year to 2020. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government published statistical information in the early performance of Fair Start Scotland in November last year. It showed we made a strong start with nearly 5,000 people joining the service since April 2018. The Scottish Government continues to robustly manage individual providers to ensure that over the length of the Fair Start Scotland service, we reach our ambition of supporting a minimum of 38,000 individuals into employment. Information on Fair Start Scotland will continue to publish on a quarterly basis, and I'm also committed to regular reporting progress on Fair Start Scotland to Parliament. Brian Whittle. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response, but he didn't actually answer the question. Um, the Scottish Government has said in the first six months of the programme, as he said, uh, just under 5,000 people took part. Uh, to hit 38,000, uh, the pace will need to be picked up. 
So we do need to know how many people are expected to participate and when. So if I could try again, at the end of this first year, how many people does he expect to have participated in Fair Start Scotland? Minister. Well, if I could re-emphasise again, we'll continue to update Parliament on a, an ongoing basis, and by the end of this year, we'll know precisely how many that will be. But let me say this to Brian Whittle. What I didn't hear there was one shred of welcome for the fact that our programme, on a voluntary basis, unlike the UK government's programme compelling people to take part in employment programmes, is supporting 5,000 people on a personalised basis on principles of dignity and respect, supporting 5,000 people across the country into employment. I think that's a significant achievement and I think that should be welcomed by all. Question number 12, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how a no-deal Brexit could impact on Scotland's economy. Cabinet Secretary. We've indicated that a hard Brexit could lead to a loss of up to 8.5% of GDP in Scotland by 2030 and that's equivalent to £2,300 per individual. Sandra White. Uh, thank the Minister for that reply. The Minister will aware of the Fraser of Allender report from October 2018, Brexit and the Glasgow City Region, where it states of the 40,000 Glasgow City Region jobs related to estimates, exports, sorry, it is estimated 20,000 of these jobs are within Glasgow City area. Does the Minister agree that the path the Tory government are dragging us down will jeopardise both the 20,000 jobs in Glasgow City as well as thousands of more jobs across the country? And this is completely unacceptable. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the member Sandra White asks uh, me about the, the path that the Conservatives are, are dragging us down. I don't even think they know what path they're dragging us down at the moment. I want to say that their cat candidness in this is, is appalling. It's having a material impact on the economy. It, those um, statistics articulated by, by Sandra White uh, are accurate. And I, I would really encourage uh, the UK government um, to engage constructively with others to try and find another way through this, as the Scottish government has repeatedly set out in our compromise positions. Question number 13, Alex Rowley. <coughs> Thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the analysis by COSLA, which suggests that the 2019-20 local government settlement will result in a £237 million reduction to the core revenue budget and a decrease to the core capital budget of £17 million. Pounds. Minister Kate Forbes. Well, despite continued UK government cuts to Scotland's resource budget, we've continued to treat local government very fairly, and the COSLA analysis fails to take into account the total funding package, which includes an additional £210 million to deliver on our commitment for the expansion of early learning and childcare entitlement, and £160 million for investment in social care. That is real funding to support real day-to-day -day core services. To exclude it presents a distorted picture of the resources available to local councils. And the facts are clear that in 2019-20, the local government finance settlement of 11.1 billion pounds will provide a cash increase of 197.5 million pounds for local revenue services and an increase in capital funding of 207.6 million pounds. Alex Rowley. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. I think COSLA, what COSLA say is that they accept that an additional £237 million is being made available uh, that is to fund the priorities that the Scottish Government are putting forward. But as the Finance Secretary said at the uh, Local Government Committee this morning, that whilst you have your priorities, then the, uh, the, the local councils are having to look at what priorities they have to cut. And in Fife, parents, pupils um, and teachers cannot understand why in this current year in secondary schools over £2 million is being cut from the budgets. Five councils say that as a result of the proposed budget of the Finance Secretary, over £11 million will be cut next year and that schools will have to take their share of the cut. How can that be seen as a growth in budget? Well, it can be seen as a growth in budget because the analysis from SPICE is clear. The total allocation from the Scottish Government to local authorities in 2019-20 has gone up in real terms. That is real money to be spent on real day-to-day -day services like schools, nurseries, support to extend free personal care, the expansion of early learning and childcare, health and social care. COSLA identified these as areas of pressure for local authorities during the budget negotiations and the Scottish Government has recognised the partnership approach and provided additional funding. It's real people that will benefit from that real investment in real day-to-day -day services across this country. Murder Fraser. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The um, Scottish Government has been given an increase in its block grant from Westminster in real terms from last year to this year, and yet in its draft budget to Parliament, what the Scottish Government are proposing is not only an increase in the tax gap for income taxpayers about earning above £27,000 between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but they're also delivering severe cuts in the core grant to local authorities throughout yeah. Scotland that will mean real cuts to the services our constituents get. So we're being asked to pay more money, but we're getting less in return. Yeah. Why would anyone vote for this budget? Minister. Well, that's in sharp contrast to the comments made by Graeme Simpson this morning, who conceded that there was more money yeah. um, going to local authorities. As I said in the last answer, the analysis from SPICE is clear. The total allocation from the Scottish Government to local authorities in 2019-20 has gone up in real terms. And that is against a context when our block grant will be almost £2 billion lower in real terms for 2019-20 compared to 2010 11. So we have reversed a real terms cut in our budget to ensure that we protect the public services that are enjoyed by the people of Scotland across this country. And John Mason. Uh, thank you. I wonder if the Minister could clarify for the Parliament whether either the Labour or the Conservative parties who appear to want more money for local government have suggested where that should come from. And in particular, have they suggested it might come from the NHS? Are they wanting cuts to the NHS? I believe the only suggestion we have from the Tories is that they cut £500 million from the budget, but they haven't indicated where they would cut that from. Thank you, and I'm afraid that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Marie Goujon on improving animal welfare. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible.